that there's a difference between what he brought and there's a difference between how he brought it. Okay? So that's going to be kind of a substructure here. First, let's look at the legitimacy of what Cain brought. The legitimacy of what Cain brought. It says, verse 3, In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to Yahweh. And then verse 4, And Abel presented an offering some of the firstborn of his flock in their fat portions. Now there's debate as to whether the reason that Cain, Cain's uh, offering was rejected is that it wasn't blood, it wasn't an animal. But that's just, that's not fleshed out in Scripture. Turn over to Leviticus 2. Now Leviticus 2 is about the, is all about the grain offering. Alright? And so it says, When anyone brings a grain offering as a gift to the Lord, his gift must consist of fine flour, he used to pour olive oil on it, put frankincense on it, bring it to Aaron's sons and the priests. The priests will hand the priest will take a handful of fine flour and oil from it, along with its frankincense, and will burn this memorial portion of it on the altar. A fire offering of a pl- of a pleasing of a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering will belong to Aaron and his sons in the holiest part of the fire offerings to Yahweh. And as you go through this this chapter, you see that everything in this offering is grain. Turn back to Genesis. Everything in the offering is grain. There's no animals, but it's said to be pleasing to the Lord. And so first, grain fruit, all these things, they're pleasing to the Lord. It doesn't necessarily have to be an animal. Now, what Amos 5.22 is going to say, God is angry with the nation because of all their sacrifices, these animal sacrifices they're bringing, and they're bringing it just to bring it. They're bringing it just as a routine, go through the motions kind of worship to God, and he says, I hate your offerings. I hate them. And so what we see in that passage is that the fact that blood is present in the offering doesn't necessarily mean that God likes it either. Right? God looks at the heart. And that's the point of this passage. Not that Cain brought fruit of the ground and Abel brought animals, but God looks at the heart. So the legitimacy of what Cain brought, now let's look at the illegitimacy of how Cain brought. And first we're going to see the source is different. Look in the, look in the text. It says, in the course of time, now notice this, in the course of time, Cain presented some of, what does it say? The land's produce. Right? And now look down at Abel. It says, And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of, what? His flock. Now the author is bringing a slight distinction here. He calls Cain's offering from the lands, some, some of the produce from the land. And then when he's describing Abel's offering, he's saying it's Abel's offering that he's bringing. So what that... What that points out is the fact of the the value of the offering is Cain is basically just bringing something that that he can afford. Something that's not really going to cost him. Whereas Abel is bringing something costly. Abel is bringing something that he's going to take a financial hit from. And now look at the quality. It's very generic when it describes Cain's offering. It says, he just presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. But then when the author describes Abel's, it says, and Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. What he's saying is that Cain, he just, he brought an offering. But when Abel brought his offering, Abel's offering was the best that he had. 
It was the very best. So notice that different source, different quality, and what these things show is a different heart. <coughs> the two brothers brought an offering, and they each had different heart motivations. Look at Hebrews 11.4. Hebrews 11, verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. By this he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through this. Notice that it was by faith. Abel came with a heart full of faith. Cain, 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 Cain. <laughs> you want to say it? You say it. Cain came with a routine heart. He came with a heart just going through the motions. Abel came full of faith. And as you look at this word, better, it says Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. This has connotations of, of bigger in size, more valuable, um, more substantial. Cain brought, Abel brought the best. And what Abel brought cost him. Cain's was cheap. And that showed the difference in their hearts. Turn back to Genesis 4. I gotta admit, as I was just studying this passage, you know, I just it really broke my heart because I can relate to Cain. Can you not? I mean, how often can I just come to God and as a result of just not prioritizing the time that I need with him. You know, I'm, I'm going through a busy day and all these things are piling up on my plate and then I come to the end of the day and I just rush through prayer or I just hurry up and, and read scripture just because i got to get it done. You know, that's, that's just going through the motions. You know, that's just like Cain. And there are so many ways that I can, that I can do this. You know, I can just hurry up, well, no, not hurry up, slow down and get the sleep that I want. Maybe I don't even necessarily need. But then what happens my, my quiet time to get pushed aside and I end up praying quickly in the shower or praying quickly on the way to a seminary or something. You know, just kind of going through the motions. I got, I got to get this stuff done. I know that I, I'm supposed to be doing this. I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I just hurry up and check it off. It's just like Cain. It's just going through the motions. Just giving God my leftovers. Because I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Right? But look at how God responds to that. The second part of verse 4, it says, Yahweh had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he was downcast. Why do we fall into these routines of just these ruts of just going through the routines, just going through the motions? You know, why do we fall into these things? But I think a better question is. How do we keep from falling into it? You know, that's, that's the lesson that we want to learn, is it not? We want to know why so that we can learn not to do it. Is that right? I think one of the main reasons that I can fall into these, that we can fall into these, is that we so easily forget the glories of the stuff that we just sang. We, we so easily forget the glories of the gospel. God 
created us so that we would worship him. God created us so that we would worship him. The very first humans that he ever created said, no, I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And it plunged the whole human race into sin and to have a sinful nature. And all of us, as soon as we come out of our mother's womb, are, we have a sin nature and by nature are sinful. Look at Ephesians 2. What a tremendous passage. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once previously walked, according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the atmospheric domain, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We all too previously, previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and by nature were children under wrath as the others were also. And then, the most glorious words you can ever hear, but God, who is abundant in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in our trespasses. By grace, you're saved. By grace, you're saved. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. I was dead in my trespasses and my sins. There was nothing that I could do. Nothing that I could do. But by grace, and because of His great love for us, He saved us. And He made us free from our sin. He made us free from our sin. And then He rises on the third day to prove that He is God. And that he is victorious over death and sin. And one day we will experience that same resurrection. And we will have that same glorious body. And spend that eternity forever with God. Praising his name. Living in gratitude for what he did. Amen? Now that is a glorious reality. That is an awesome reality. But how easily I forget that. And it is so easy. An apologetics paper. Are you serious? It's going to make you forget the glory of the gospel. And so I offer to God routine sacrifices I offer to God going through the motions type worship just like Cain did. And so what this passage reminds me of is that I need to take my life, I need to take my devotion to Christ back from my busyness. I need to take my devotion to Christ back from my self-serving attitude, my job, my homework, Whatever it is that takes my devotion away, that takes my time away. So what are some practical ways that, that we can do this, that I can do this? C.J. Mahaney says this. He says, we humans are creatures of habit, aren't we? And our habits reflect our true selves. We all build our daily lives around our priorities and passions. But a cross-centered life is made up of cross-centered days. So let me just give you briefly six practical ways to have cross-centered days. Let me give us six practical ways to have cross-centered days. So we don't fall into the same temptation that Cain did to offer God just going through the motions type offerings. The first, memorize gospel passages. Memorize gospel passages. Like Isaiah 53, he was crushed for our iniquities. Romans 3, all have fallen short. Romans 5, Christ died at the right time for the ungodly. 
Galatians 2, I don't nullify the grace of God. If justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Justification is by grace. And the list can go on. Memorize gospel passages. Number two, preach the gospel to yourself. You know the gospel. If you're saved, you believe the gospel, you know the gospel. Preach it to yourself. Preach it to yourself daily. Number three, pray the gospel. It's, it's the only reason that you can even pray in the first place. Pray the gospel. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you that you are a merciful, gracious God, that we can just be encouraged that we will always be with you, that you are always with us. Pray the gospel. Sing the gospel. Isaac and the rest of our worship team leaders lead us in songs that always exalt Christ, exalt the gospel. Crossroads, they always sing songs that exalt Christ, exalt the gospel. Get those songs and sing them in the shower if you want. I don't care. Just sing the gospel. Remind yourself of the gospel. So, memorize gospel passages. Preach the gospel to yourself. Pray the gospel. Sing the gospel. Fifthly, review, review your testimony. Rather than just forget all the mistakes of your life and just say, I don't even want to think about those things. Think about those things in the context of forgiveness. Man, what a great Savior that He could save me from all of that stuff. What a great Savior we worship. So review your testimony. Number six, study the gospel. Increase all the more in your understanding of who Christ is and what he's done on your behalf. Become a student of scripture. Read good gospel-centered books. Learn about the gospel. Let me just quickly go back through those. Memorize gospel passages. Preach the gospel to yourself. Pray the gospel. Sing the gospel. Review your testimony. Study the gospel. John Stott compares the cross to a blazing bonfire. He writes, The cross is the blazing fire at which the flame of our love is kindled. We have to get near enough to it for its sparks to fall on us. And may this song that I'm about to read you be always on our hearts. It says, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, just give me Jesus. When I'm alone, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, just give me Jesus. When I come to die, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. So our first lesson is that God hates it when we just go through the motions. So we need to be sold out for Christ. Secondly, sin loves to devour those who succumb to temptation. So master sin as it lurks at your door. Sin loves to devour those who succumb to temptation, so master it as it look, lurks at your door. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, Then Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you furious, and why are you downcast? If you do right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do right, sin is crouching at the door, its desire is for you, but you must master it. But Cain said to his brother, let's go out to the field. And while they're in the field, Cain attacked him and killed him. Notice that God directly confronts Cain in his sin. And then he gives him three strategies. Even before he goes out and sins, he gives him three strategies for avoiding it all. And these are the things that we can learn from. So three strategies. First, just do good. Just do good. He says, 
Why are you furious? Why are you downcast? If you do right, won't you be accepted? Just do good. Be zealous for good works. Romans 12, verse 11 says, Do not lack diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And in Titus 2, 14, it says, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse us for Himself, a people of His own possession, eager to do good works. So the first strategy to fight against your sin is just do good. Just do good. Number two, recognize, recognize the temptation. It says, but if you don't do right, sin is crouching at your door. His desire is for you, but you must master it. So how do you recognize temptation? Well, you feed your mind, you, you become a student of Scripture so that your conscience and your heart are well informed about what good and what evil are. And so then you're able to know when temptation is tempting you and then do good, like you said. When you have a well-informed conscience because you're a student of the Scripture, the Holy Spirit uses that within the believer to show him what sin is in his life and help him and show him the way out of it so that he's able to defeat the sin in his life. So recognize the temptation. Number three, crush the temptation. So if you don't be right, sin's at your door. It's desires for you, but you must master it. Now there are a lot of practical things that you can do with this, right? You can put a program on your computer so that it sends it to your friends, whatever you're looking at. You can develop accountability relationships. You, know, you can get in a discipleship relationship with people who are discipling you and just talk about the sin that's going on in your life and they can help you through that and they can point you to scripture. They can be your guide in that. They can be your help in that. But ultimately, when you give yourself to temptation, it's a form of idolatry. It's a form of idolatry. You say, God says, this is what I want you to do. I'm your God. And you say, just like Adam and Eve said, you're God, but I don't want to do what you're doing. I don't want you to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. And so you displace God, and you set yourself up as your own God. And you do exactly what you want to do instead of what he wants you to do. It's a form of idolatry. And so the first thing we've got to understand is that to crush temptation, we have to die to ourselves. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 25. Matthew 16, 25. And it says, for whoever wants to save his life, it's in the part where Jesus is going to say, take up the cross. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. And then he asks this pointed question. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? If you want to defeat sin, if you want to crush that temptation, if we want to crush the temptation in our life, we have to die to ourselves. We have to take up our cross, just as Christ tells us here, daily. This is a daily pursuit. Just like those other things, preaching the gospel to yourself, Reminding yourself of the gospel, seeing the gospel, there's daily activities. Daily, we have to commit to die to ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow after Christ. And victory comes 
as we serve our Savior rather than serving ourselves. This is exactly what all sin is. It's repudiation of God's claim on your life, and it's a declaration on your part of your own autonomy. Saying, I am my own person. I'll do what I want to do. You're no longer legitimately claiming my life and taking your claim off my life. And practically, that's what our sin is like. And when we put it that way, it's, it's really gross, is it not? Like, I would, I would never say that to God. I would never say it, but that's exactly what we say. And we must never, never be like that. But one of the glorious aspects of the gospel is that we are. That's not the glorious aspect. But when we are, there's forgiveness in Christ. There's forgiveness at the cross. God is a merciful, gracious God. And if and when we succumb to that temptation, if and when we do sin and take him off the throne and put ourselves on the throne and we confess that as sin and we say, I agree with what you call it. It's sin in my life and I hate it. You ask him for forgiveness and you turn from your sin to do good, to do righteousness and he forgives you and you are completely restored with him. And that's the glory of the gospel. But unfortunately, for Cain, as we read, in verse 8, it says, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So may we learn from Cain's mistake. May we learn the lesson that Cain didn't learn. That sin is dangerous. And that we have to fight sin, identify it, sin and, and crush it when we find it. So the first lesson, God hates it when we just go through the motions. So we have to be sold out for Christ. And sin loves to devour those who succumb to temptation. So we have to master it before it overtakes us. We have to master it while it's at the door. So in closing, when he was 16 years old, after just getting saved and real excited about his salvation, William Featherstone of Montreal, Canada, about an hour and a half from where we grew up, penned these words. 16 years old. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And may our love for Jesus and our constant nearness to that bonfire of the cross set our hearts on fire for him. May it give us a passion for the glory of Christ and motivate us to identify, weed out, and destroy that sin that separates us from the Savior that we so dearly love. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that your word directs us. We are thankful that your word guides us and gives us insight into our own sinfulness, into our own folly. We're so thankful for the gospel that though we are sinful, though we so often fall short, you forgive us. God, you completely restore us. One day, we are so thankful that we will live perfectly in your presence, always worshiping and glorifying you. We love you and we long for that day and we look forward to that day. Be with us as we sing your praises now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's